Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to our uh, Department of Medicine Academics Feast. Uh, for today, we are again honored and very much excited to call back and have Dr. George Ansar back again for our lecture series. Uh, today, we'll uh, part two of his lecture on approach to mixed acid based abnormalities. So, I hope you guys have been able to go through all the previous the slides which have been sent to you and hopefully uh, to look into the quiz part of that also. And so, I will be explaining anyways on that. And then, any questions, please feel free to ask uh, through the session or maybe drop down the chat box. You can even otherwise mail to medicine at cmcvello.ac.in for any queries or even for accessing any of these slides, presentations which has not been provided. So in this later on this lecture, soon we upload our Department of Medicine YouTube website. We again, sir, very much honored to have you here. Uh, thanks to you and over to you, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. So this is a continuation of the session done yesterday on evaluating mixed acid base uh, abnormalities and uh, we discussed the pure forms yesterday that is the respiratory acidosis alkalosis metabolic acidosis and uh, alkalosis but in real life things don't come pure they come mixed hybridized for instance in a person with uh, cardiac arrest there's a combination of being unable to breathe as well as lack of perfusion because the heart has stopped. That's a combination of respiratory acidosis and metabolic acidosis. Similarly, septic shock is metabolic acidosis because of perfusion problems and respiratory alkalosis because the cytokines drive the respiratory center. The metabolic alkalosis is present in a patient with uh, on flusamide and he has also got respiratory acidosis uh, if a person has got a chronic COPD. Pregnancy patients have uh, metabolic alkalosis physiologically, sorry, respiratory alkalosis physiologically because progesterone drives the respiratory center. If a person presents with hyperemesis, you on top of that, you lose acid from the stomach, you have a metabolic alkalosis. So you can get various combinations of uh, respiratory and metabolic problems. And the idea of this session is to help you tease out the various strands of what is the final common presentation. You can also have combinations of rest, metabolic acidosis and metabolic alkalosis. Person with renal failure who's vomiting could have the combination of an acidosis and an alkalosis, both due to a metabolic problem. And you can also have triple abnormalities, but more of that later. Let's proceed with our basic understanding. Before I proceed to this lecture, I just want to make clear, there seems to be some confusion about the previous lecture, that the peripheral venous are blood sample will not be adequate to evaluate uh, the metabolic and respiratory status of a patient. A central venous sample is got good correlation, not for oxygen, but for carbon dioxide and pH. But as I mentioned yesterday, if the car out cardiac output is low, the CO2 will show a big difference. So it is not useful in patients who have a low cardiac output along with other problems. So it is actually a central venous blood gas sample is useful if a person's only problem is a respiratory problem. Once it goes into shock, then again, you'll find discrepancies in the carbon dioxide and the pH. So, and uh, peripheral venous sample should never be used for uh, evaluating the metabolic and respiratory status of a person. I've given you the references. Those interested can read up further on that. But as I said, venous samples are more comfortable for the person and the central lines are already present. So you can always take us for a stable patient to see how the patient is doing. All right, back to our basic equation. Now, what is a compensatory response? You have a primary abnormality either in the respiratory side or the metabolic side. And the measures a body implements to correct the pH back to normal is a compensatory response. It is not just the hydration reaction, not just the process of dissolving carbon dioxide in water. So if a person has a respiratory problem, the body tries to compensate the change in pH, which is occurred as a result of the respiratory problem. And the primary organ for this is the kidneys. And if you have a problem on the metabolic side, here the problem may be either because of the kidneys or the tissues, which may involve muscles or liver, whatever is causing a metabolic acidosis or alkalosis, the respiratory system tries to compensate. So that is a compensatory response. And the whole idea of trying to dissect out the strands is to know whether the compensatory response 
is purely a compensatory response or whether it's out of proportion to what you expect. If it is out of proportion to what you would expect, then there is a second disorder. There's some other process driving the other system which will actually only respond to a feedback stimulus. It is doing it out of proportion to the stimulus. So that is when you diagnose a second disorder. Now to approach this, there are various approaches. You look at the bottom of the screen, there are black box approaches. You have an ABG map, which is simple. You just plot the hydrogen ion or the pH and the BCO2, and you join the two lines in the X and Y axis, and you get a diagnosis. But you really don't have any insight on what is going on. And the modern counterpart to this is the apps. You can go to the net or on your device, you put in your numbers and you get a diagnosis. So I'm not going to deal with those. I just show you those apps are available, but it doesn't give you any, any insight on what is actually happening. I'll also give you a useful rule of thumb later on in this lecture. Let us go back to the standard approaches with insight. The first one looks at the Sigurd Anderson approach, which approaches the problem through the carbon dioxide bicarb pathway, either by using empirical equations or by using an approach known as the standard bicarbonate approach. The anion gap is a complement of this and helps you to evaluate metabolic problems in a little more detailed way. These approaches were primarily American from Boston. The base excess approach was initially propagated by the Europeans and it's a fairly much simpler approach where the heavy lifting of calculation is done by the machine. But the Americans really don't like it. If you look at much of the American books, they prefer to give you the equations. And the Canadian, Peter Stewart was a Canadian physiologist who propagated his approach in the 90s, but it caught on only over the last five to 10 years. And it gives you a lot of insight onto metabolic disturbances. I will approach each of this slowly so that you understand the concepts. All right, I would like to say this again, please start off with the clinical scenario start out what the patient actually has. Is this going to be a metabolic or a respiratory problem? If you don't do that, your thinking process may be skewed. Now, this is the basic rule for the compensatory response. If you have a primary respiratory problem, where you expect the CO2 to be abnormal, the correcting factor would be the bicarb. And you look at the bicarb, and see whether the bicarb is within the calculated limits of compensation. If it is not within the limits, whatever method you use, then there is a second disorder. But remember, compensatory mechanisms do not correct to the pH to the middle of the acceptable range because in any feedback system, the drive to correct becomes weaker as the target parameter reaches its desired range. If you have a low blood pressure, in response to that, you have a tachycardia. As your blood pressure comes back to normal, the tachycardia will tend to die off because it's achieving its purpose. So the same thing for acid-based abnormalities. A compensatory mechanism never corrects the pH to the middle of your normal range. If you have a pH of 7.40, it is not due to compensation. Either there is a second disorder or it's a normal patient. And to take this further, compensatory mechanisms never overcorrect. That's not possible at all. So keep these basic principles in mind. Now, the renal response to a respiratory disorder is slow, but much more successful. Whereas a respiratory response to a metabolic disorder is fast within minutes, but it is less complete. Because the renal response is slower, Respiratory disorders are further classified into acute and chronic disorders. Acute disorder is when the renal system has, system has not kicked in adequately to bring the pH within the acceptable range. It will never come to the middle of the acceptable range, but at least to the lower limit of the acceptable range. So if there's a rise in CO2 and a sharp drop in pH, you can be sure that's an acute respiratory disorder if there is no other second disorder. A chronic respiratory disorder, the pH change comes to the lower limit of the acceptable range or just beyond it. But for metabolic disorders, there's no acute and chronic subsets because respiratory compensation is rapid. Second point, 
If there is a metabolic disorder and the compensation is by the respiratory system, you would expect in a metabolic alkalosis the CO2 to rise, trying to buffer off to reduce the change in pH. But this also has a limiting factor because you cannot reduce ventilation indefinitely without causing hypoxia. So the respiratory system has to handle both. So the ceiling is about 60. Beyond that, the CO2 doesn't rise in compensation. And for the reverse, the CO2 doesn't drop below beyond uh, 10 for a compensated response. So that's the limits within which the respiratory system can compensate. If it is beyond that, it is likely it's a second disorder driving the respiratory system to PCO2 is above 60 or less than 10. Okay, this is the APG map I talked about earlier. You just take the hydrogen ion concentration in nanomoles per liter, take the PCO2, just draw the lines, and where it falls in, you'll have your diagnosis. Now, this is not a very interesting approach. It's mechanical, so I shall leave it for the time being, just for your uh, information. And the counterpart for this is, yeah, you put in the values and you get a diagnosis. And of course, this also says you should not substitute for clinical context. All right, back to the first approach. The hydrogen ion concentration is basically based on this equation, 24 into the PaCO2 by the bicarb. Now that is a hydrogen ion concentration, not the pH. To use that equation, you need to convert the pH to the hydrogen ion concentration. You can do it in your mind if you remember three figures. If you look at the hydrogen ion concentration, remember it's in nanomoles per liter. Remember 40 above that, what 10 above is 50, 10 below is 30. The pH corresponding to 40 nanomoles per liter is 7.40. Corresponding to 50, it is 7.30. To 30, it is 7.50. Now remember, the concentration of hydrogen ions can double or half. Whereas the pH is on a logarithmic scale, and the logarithm of 2 is 0.3. So doubling the hydrogen ion concentration would be equivalent to add subtracting 0.3 from the pH scale. So using that, you can have a whole set of values. And within the physiological range, you can work out the corresponding hydrogen ion concentration if you are so inclined. But this is only for physiology. You can't do it for the whole of chemistry. So this is only between a certain levels, between seven and eight for the physiology. We don't usually see patients above eight. We do occasionally see less than seven, but there you cannot use this method anymore. But once you have plugged in the hydrogen ion concentration, you can use that equation and to maintain a pH at 7.740, the ratio of bicarb to CO2 must be 20 is to 1. That's what it works out to. Say the normal bicarb is 24, the normal pHCO2 is 40. 0.03 is the, the solubility constant of carbon dioxide. I'll give you 1.2, and that's 20. If the ratio is not 20 is to 1, the pH will change. So if you actually look back at the equation, If the PCO2 goes up, if you want to maintain the ratio, the bicarb has to go up. So the kidney has to produce more bicarb. If the bicarb goes up at a metabolic alkalosis, if the ratio has to be maintained, you have to retain CO2. So the respiratory system has to hypoventilate. So that's the physiology behind the equation. And uh, this is the way you tend to use the bicarb to understand whether there is a second disorder or not. Now, this is the American's equations. I really am not fond of this, but for information, I'm giving it to you. But the basic principle is, you calculate the expected bicarbonate based on the CO2 rise. And then look at the actual bicarbonate. Any discrepancy is due to an additional disorder. Same for respiratory and metabolic. But I'm not going to go this, into this in detail. It was very difficult to remember these equations, except to summarize it short and say, in a respiratory disorder, for an acute respiratory disorder, the usual rise in carbon dioxide, for every 10 millimeters rise in carbon dioxide, the rise in bicarb is one. For chronic, it is four. For alkalosis, it is two. For chronic alkalosis, it's five. In other words, changes in chronic are more than in acute, as expected, and changes in alkalosis. Washing out CO2 causes more changes in bicarb than retaining CO2. I mean, this is just an empirical summary for you. Now, this was taken before the advent of uh, 
chip based uh, abg machines people in the icu try to shortcut the process and say if you actually measure a blood samples paco2 the actual paco2 and then subsequently expose it to a carbon dioxide of 40 you are removing the respiratory component and any bicarb difference they persists with the pco to 40 is due to a metabolic disturbance so that was the logic behind which uh, the standard bicarbonate was created so the actual bicarbonate is what is actually measured in the sample and the standard bicarbonate is the same sample exposed to 40 millimeters mercury of pco2 in other words are trying to remove the respiratory component this was this is now done in the machine but in olden days it was done by the lab technician who breathed into the blood sample assuming his co2 was 40 and then measured it again this is just a bit of historical interest i am putting that in there but if you actually look at this printout from a blood gas recent blood gas report you can actually see that this person's pco2 is 58 which is high actual bicarbonate is 17 standard bicarbonate is 14 in other words the difference of 3 is due to the high co2 when you equilibrate the sample to 40 the bicarb drop so this person actually has a metabolic acidosis on top of the respiratory acidosis so if you look at the standard bicarb it gives you a bit of insight into the process so that is how standard bicarbonate comes to be part of all abg printouts or at least most of the abg printouts include a standard bicarb and this is what it means now we come to the anion gap there is no real gap the gap is actually is what between what you measure and what you don't measure the body is not electrically charged therefore the positive ions have to be equal to the negative ions but we don't measure all the positive and the negative ions therefore there is an apparent gap and practically the anion gap is the and total of sodium plus potassium minus the chloride and the bicarbonate this is almost fully made up of the albumin component which is basically negatively charged protein but in situations where you have an additional negative ion like a strange one like lactate which is norm normally very low or keto acids or beta hydroxybutyrate or some poisons the chloride plus bicarb component is not the only negative ion because there is an additional negative ion and the body is not electrically charged you will find there is an apparent gap and this gap is made of made use of to evaluate a metabolic acidosis so you have an anion gap and metabolic acidosis if the anion gap is high it's because of addition of acids which are not normally present in the body lactates keto acids or poisons like salicylates i mean overdose not a poison normal anion gap is when you actually have a problem because of loss of bicarbonate or failure to excrete hydrogen ions and they all measure there is no unmeasured nothing which is not ordinarily unmeasured so that comes a normal anion gap acidosis now how do we use it <coughs> excuse me if you look at the anion gap in this picture the anion gap excess occurs when there is a unusual anion coming into the body now this unusual anion needs to suppress some other an anion for it to occupy that space and that some other anion is usually bicarbonate cannot suppress chloride because i'll talk about it later chloride is a strong ion it's not pushed around by anybody else bicarb is a bit of a weak chap so you can actually push down the ionization of bicarb so this excess anion gap is taken into consideration using what is known as the de delta anion gap approach that is for every one millimole addition of mm. as that of uh, battery low for every one millimole addition of a new anion the bicarb will drop by an equivalent amount this is known as a delta anion gap the delta is the change in the anion gap the anion gap rises by one the bicarb will fall by one 
This is the same thing. But if the bicarbonate drop is higher than the, you would expect from the anion gap increase, there is an additional non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. I hope the logic is clear. If they were purely an anion gap related acidosis, the bicarb drop should be equivalent to the anion gap increase. But if the drop is much more, then you would expect there is a second disorder. So it gives you a little more insight into the metabolic component using the anion gap approach. Now we go to the base excess approach. The base excess conceptually was designed by the Europeans in Copenhagen to make this whole uh, acid base analysis a bit easier. For the respiratory component of our whole equation, the PCO2 is a good marker. But for the metabolic component, the bicarb is not such a good marker because when the carbon dioxide goes up, the bicarb also goes up. And the metabolic alkalosis, the bicarb also goes up. So carbon dioxide, is, bicarbonate is not a unique marker of a metabolic problem. It gets pushed around both by respiratory problems as well as metabolic problems. So they devise an equation, I won't go into the details, which gives you the base excess and is supposed to have the same function as PACO2 does for the respiratory system. And if you want a chemical definition, it is the amount of strong acid that must be added to one liter of fully oxygenated blood, return the chemistry of the sample to a normal pH. And base excess is, an ex is positive and base deficit is negative. Some people use negative base excess for a base deficit. But these are all just tongue twisting maneuvers. You need to understand what it means. It is considered to be a parameter which is fairly independent of a respiratory influence when it was first designed. And that was known as the actual base excess, like the actual bicarbonate. But this is a calculated value. The actual bicarb can be measured or calculated. But like everything in medicine, when it starts getting used, we'll find problems with it. It was found in vivo that the actual base excess did not correlate well with what was happening in the body. And the reason for which was which soon obvious because in that equation, hemoglobin is used as measured in the blood. But dilution buffering is through the whole ECF. It is not just in the blood. We measure pH in the blood, but the whole process of buffering occurs in the whole of the ECF. Whereas hemoglobin is just confined to the vascular system. Therefore, there was a modification of this base excess and came to be known as the standard base excess, where the actual hemoglobin was considered to be diluted in the whole of the ECF. It was about a 30 to 50 percent, depending on which manufacturer uses which algorithm. So this was known as the standard base excess and found to be much more core. Uh, having much more correlation with what actually happens in vivo. But unfortunately, the second caveat, standard base excess does not accurately, accurately reflect it, but the error is much smaller than the actual base excess. Standard base excess fails in a chronic respiratory problem, so for that there's a small correction factor. And this is the way you can, just to distill it out, in an acute respiratory acidosis and alkalosis, the change is zero for base excess. It doesn't influence the base excess. That's if you multiply the PCO2 into zero. And I'm talking about standard base excess. For a chronic respiratory acidosis alkalosis, it's 40% of the change, 0.4. For a metabolic acidosis, you're looking at the change in PCO2. The drop in basics, the change in base excess should be the equal to the change in the PCO2. And similarly, for metabolic alkalosis, it's 60%. But I will give you a, another simpler rule of thumb for the metabolic disorders. But if you want to go by the base excess method, this you have reduced it to four, actually two equations, because you have the first uh, row and the third row really is very simple to remember. Now take a deep breath. We're coming to Peter Stewart's approach, which is caught on quite a bit in the ICU and gives a lot of insight to metabolic disorders. For the respiratory disorders, it doesn't make a big change. 
Peter Stewart was the first to ask, where is the pH center in the body? There is no such center in the body which tightly regulates the pH. The pH is only a function of what the, all the other ions are doing to the hydrogen ion. Just like the bicarbonate is a weak ion on the anion side, the hydrogen ion is a weak cation. It ionizes when you measure it as an active uh, pH, active acid. It doesn't ionize, then there is not active, the pH doesn't change. So what is the approach? He, like Hoppenicius, he changed the whole spectrum. Look, don't look at the hydrogen ion, look at what's happening to influence the hydrogen ion. The hydrogen ion becomes only a surrogate of what's happening to the rest of the ion. The three things which affect it are the PCO2, that we know, strong ion difference. This is not the same as the anion gap. I'll come to that in a moment. And the total, a total, which basically consists of the strong uh, anions. Let us have a look at this in detail. I'll go slowly now because I don't want to cause confusion. These are the three determinants. Weak acids, PaCO2. We don't have to go much more into PaCO2. We know how it influences the hydrogen ion. Weak acids and strong ion difference. No change in evaluation of pure respiratory disorders by the Stewart approach. Stewart is not the first to define a strong ion, but he used it in his approach. A strong ion is defined as one which will ionize irrespective of all the other ions are doing. It doesn't care what happens to the other ion. This is on the positive side, you have sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, on the negative side, you have chloride, which is normally there, and the strong negative ions like lactate, acetoacetate, they don't care what happens. But because the human body is electrically neutral, any difference between the strong positive and the strong negative ions has to be made up by the relative ionization of the weak ions. These are the players in the field or the dancers, if you want to have it. But finally, you have to have it equal. If your strong anions go up, either your weak anions have to reduce or your weak cations have to increase. But you can't remove the ceiling. You have to have it equal. And Peter Stewart's fundamental insight was in saying that this is what happens in the body. There is no center which regulates the pH directly. Just as the fluid changes shape to mold itself, the weak ions change their charge concentration to fill the available space. And this difference is known as the strong ion difference. Remember, I re-emphasize that it is not the same as the anion gap. And this difference is usually between 35 to 37 millimoles per liter. That's the same thing. You have the strong cations and the strong anions and the weak ions dancing as the others tell them to dance. Okay, here is something which is, tells you the difference between the strong ion difference and the anion gap. The anion gap basically measures the gap between the strong cations and what do you measure? That is the chloride and the bicarb, which is partly weak and partly strong. Strong ion difference only takes the difference between the strong ions. So it is not the same as the anion gap, keep that in mind. Okay, now this tells you what actually happens when the SID changes. The first is the SID is normal. Strong ion difference is normal. The hydrogen ion concentration is normal. Everything is hunky-dory. The second part, because you increase the chloride. You increase the chloride, body has to be electrically neutral. Either weak anions have to get less or the weak cations, which is hydrogen, there's only a sole representative in that field, have to get more, which means acidosis. We don't measure the weak anions and call it by any specific name. It's a hydrogen ion which influences your enzymatic action, influences your drugs and electrolytes. So the hydrogen ion has to increase there. So a reduction of SID will result in acidosis because acidosis is a change in pH which reflects the hydrogen ion concentration. The reverse happens when the SID decreases, I'm sorry, increases. Chloride goes down or sodium goes up and then the hydrogen has to occupy a smaller space and you have alkalosis. This is just in a nutshell, SID increases, 
you get alkalosis. SID decreases, you get acidosis. So be clear in your mind what SID stands for and how it changes the hydrogen ion concentration as measured by the pH. Let us just look at how this is useful. This was brought out by a paper because the way Peter Stewart put it here, a lot of equations for each of those positive ions, including calcium and magnesium, it was not implementable at the bedside. The Feckel Stewart approach is using it at the bedside, just considers that the base excess is due to three components the SID component, the albumin component, and the unmeasured anion component, which includes strong acids like a lactate as to a state. Now, if your lactate is measured, it also is part of the equation. You can plug in the number and see how it makes sense. So base excess has three partitions, the SID component, the albumin component, not its full albumin, only 25% of that as measured per liter, and the unmeasured anions component. Let's see how this works out. We have a patient coming in with septic shock. Initial value, serum is 140, potassium is 5.5, chloride is 95, protein is okay. PO2 was 60, PCO2 is low, it's hyperventilating, pH 7.30, saturation 90%, bicarb 15, bisexus minus 10. Actively resuscitated, given 13 liters of saline over 24 hours. You measure the pH, patient looks better, oxygenation has improved, sodium has gone up, obviously. Potassium has gone down. Chloride has gone up again, obviously. Protein remains the same. PO2 is improved, you improved the perfusion. PaCO2 has gone further down. pH has got worse. Saturation is okay. You haven't fluid loaded him too much. Bicarb is five, gone down. Base excess has got worse. Now what's happening here? The traditional approach doesn't give you too much a clue as to what on earth is happening here. I've had people come and say, what on earth is this happening here? And then you look at the Stewart approach, it gives you insight. Let us use the Fenkel Stewart approach. On the first day, base excess is minus 10. Sodium minus chloride is 40 minus 95, minus 38. You're looking at the difference in SID, strong ion difference. The normal difference is 38. So here it is seven. You add the albumin component and the unmeasured anions is minus 22, whatever it is, lactate or phosphate, sulfate. We're just lumping it there for the time being. After you're given your deluge of saline, your base excess is minus 20. What's happening? You do the same calculation. You find... And remember, the algebraic signs are very important here. It's very important. If you mix up the algebraic signs, you get some weird answers. The albumin component is the same. The unmeasured anions is also the same. So what has happened to change the pH is that the SID has gone from 7 to minus 3. It is purely a saline-induced acidosis. So this gives you a real insight that you need to reduce the amount of chloride in this patient. There are very many ways to do that. But this is an insight which you get by using the Stewart approach and is very useful in many situations where the patient has been aggressively resuscitated with saline. And tells you that all you have to do is reduce the chloride and the pH returns back to normal. Now this is a rule of thumb which is not derivable by any mathematical equation, but eminently applicable in clinical practice and is applicable for metabolic problems. So if you have a patient with a metabolic acidosis or alkalosis, you would expect a change in the CO2. What change do you expect to say it is a simple disorder? Look at the pH. Say the pH is 7.20 and the person has a metabolic disorder that you have designed from a clinical scenario. You look at the two digits of the pH after the decimal point, that is 20. Add five, subtract five from it, it's 15 to 25. If your CO2 is within that range, this is only a single disorder. If it is higher, it means the respiratory system is not compensating adequately. Person may be fatiguing. He may need NIV or he may need intubation. It's a very important clue. If it is lower, there is hyperventilation. What is driving that? I'm not talking about uh, the reasons for hyperventilation in this patient, 
but it is second and double disorder at least but remember you can't use this if a ph is less than 7.10 you can use it up to 7.10 same way for upper lip for metabolic alkalosis the upper limit is 7.60 so this is a very useful rule of thumb and easier to apply than using the calculations for base excess for metabolic problems so keep it in mind let us look at a couple of other examples okay this patient has got a respiratory acidosis because the co2 is high 56.4 patient on the left side look at the base excess minus 3 so i would say that that base excess is almost normal minus 2 to plus 2 is normal but if you want to be pedantic you can say it's got a mild metabolic acidosis and a respiratory acidosis simple to analyze once i've used the hybrid approach i'm not stuck to any particular approach example on the right side this patient has got a ph which is almost normal co2 is high so you can almost all say that the person must be having two disorders you can't have a normal ph with a co2 of 65.9 Look at the base excess; it is positive. So he's got a metabolic alkalosis and a respiratory acidosis. Couple more examples. This is a basic metabolic problem. Starting off, clinical scenario: metabolic. This patient's pH is seven point one four zero. Two digits of the decimal point after of the pH is fourteen. Add five, subtract five, nine to nineteen. Look at the CO two, fifteen point six. Bang in the middle of nine to nineteen, so it's a single disorder. Second patient, seven point one seven seven, seventeen plus five minus five. I've made it eighteen because it is point one seven seven. So eighteen plus five, thirteen to twenty three. Actual PCO two is higher. so this person is not ventilating as well as he should his respiratory muscles may be fatiguing or there's something else interfering with his respiratory compensation it's a mixed disorder and he may need respiratory support or as this progresses he'll start getting more and more weaker accumulate co2 and crash this is helpful for you to assess whether the person is likely to crash i'm not saying you intubate him straight away you can give him respiratory support in form of niv or whatever else he needs and then observe him more carefully than you would for the first patient you know he's compensating quite well sorry wrong button okay i suggest you use a hybrid approach you must know each approach well if you're going to teach you must know each all approaches but if you're going to be a clinician at the bedside you can use a hybrid approach i would start with the clinical scenario to emphasize it look at oxygenation first don't forget that people jump on to the met metabolic status because that is more exciting but look at the oxygenation first is it adequate look at whether the gas transfer is okay pao2 and pf ratio then look at the acid base status if the primary problem is metabolic look at the ph use the rule of thumb look at the co2 is there a double disorder if it's respiratory Look at the base excess. Tells you whether there's a double disorder, and use the Stuart Stuart approach to understand metabolic disorders with insight. Questions are welcome, and I would suggest you go through all those twenty ABGs, and working through them itself will crystallize this in your mind. You can form your own way you want to analyze an ABG. You don't have to be a purist and say I will only use the American approach or the European approach. or the canadian approach we are indians we can use any approach okay sir uh, any questions no um, will we be having a discussion on this quiz no what i'll do is i'm going to release the answers to the quiz after this question session and they can compare the answers they have got with what my answers are and we can start discussing it either today or from the from the next session they can send in their queries to you during the week because uh, there's no deadline and we can discuss it during the next six sessions also
So there is no problem. We know time limit to it. The only reason is to increase understanding. So it's not that the ABG discussion has to stop with this session. Respiratory uh, topics also have a lot of ABG in it. So we can proceed our discussion uh, even during the next two, three, four, five sessions too. So I don't know. I'll give the answers. I'll be evening. I'll we will release it. Let people work through it because they've got additional information from this slide. Work through it and then look at the answers. Compare it. If you don't agree, we will discuss. If anyone had already gone through it, if any questions are on this session now, what we had? Uh, if they've already gone through it, I suggest be patient because let the others also think through. Give them all a chance to think through it. So any questions? I mean, we are going to discuss it. We'll discuss all twenty. No problems. Please feel free to ask questions. Yeah. Questions other than relating to the quiz. We just hope you're there on the other side. We have five to ten minutes. I think they're uh, <laughs> overload of information. Yeah, it's all right. That's why I said let them to get time to process it. Anyway, they've had the slides. I'll be sending the second set of slides. Yes, sir. We'll send it. Yeah. The one question which is up. Uh, yeah, yeah. So in the first respiratory ABG. No, where is that? Can we get back to that? Yeah. Which way? Sorry. You want that? Which, what the, which, which one was they referring to? Because first respiratory ABG. Though base excess is minus. Can, it, can you just can we look at the full thing? Was it the comparison this one? Uh, no. No. Basics, yeah. This one? Yes. This yeah, one. yeah. The first uh, respiratory ABG, though base excess was minus three, mm -hmm. standard bicarb was lower than the patient bicarb. Standard bicarb lower than the patient. That means that the PCO2 of 40, the bicarb is dropped, which means there's a metabolic component. Uh, so, question is when uh, means patient is trying to compensate, then why is the patient? No, is patient is trying to compensate, is correct. And the compensation is appropriate, correct? Mm. Yeah, Correct. Correct. So, what I'm trying to, first respect ABG. One second. What is the question? Uh, I'm trying to understand the question. The first respect. Still, it's only minus. No, but the standard bicarbonate is lower than standard bicarbonate and patient by. You mean actual bicarbonate, not patient bicarbonate. Actual bicarbonate. Both are patients bicarbonate. The standard bicarbonate lower than actual bicarbonate tells you that there's an associated metabolic acidosis. That's all it means. So minus three base excess also tells you the same thing. It can be anything. Uh, I think they're thinking it's something else. Base excess can be. It's a representative of the bicarb also. Right? Base excess reflects what the bicarb yeah. would be doing. They were thinking in addition. No, I, all, I, all I was trying to do is trying to tell you that the standard bicarb will give you information which the base excess also will give Perfect. you. It's the same. It's the same thing. It's actually looking at it from two different perspectives. I was trying to give you all the perspectives. Is it looking at a car or a picture from three different angles? The question is whether it was a different thing or this? No, but the diagnosis will come to the same. Yeah. That there is an associated, but as I said before, we want to be very pedantic, can put a metabolic acidosis there. But in practical purposes, you start treating only when the base axis crosses five. So this is very minor. So that's why I said, if you want to be very accurate, you can say there's a metabolic acidosis. Which is why the base excess, uh, sorry, not the base excess minus three, and also the reason why the standard bicarbonate is lower than the actual bicarbonate. So the next question is with respect to the treatment that they're given. And, I mean, the, when we have associated. That's a good question. So uh, there are many commercial solutions which are used uh, without chloride. They're all very expensive. What we do in practice is we put bicarb in dextrose. So that will give you a chloride-free sodium. So add 80 ml of 8.4% sodium bicarbonate to 500 ml of 5% dextrose. You dilute it one in five. That will give you a, around 1% 1 or 1.2% 1 1 of uh, equivalent to normal saline, but without the chloride. And you use that as a maintenance fluid. And it's been found quite effective, at least in my practice, without much, much of a problem. The only problem is when the sugar is also high, then you can't use this. If they have a high blood sugar, you can't use this. If the sugar is normal, you can add on bicarb onto uh, dextrose or 5% glu glucose and use that as a maintenance fluid instead of sodium chloride. So basically you're giving chloride-free sodium. And this is a, in, in, 
useful when the sodium is low and the chloride is high. But if sodium is high and chloride is high and the slit is narrow, then you can't use this. You just give plain dextrose. Plain dextrose is okay. You dilute both. So if you want to dilute only one, use that. If you want to dilute both, use just plain glucose. It will dilute both. Yeah, anticipating this in any time when we have this resuscitation. Yes. Well. This is very common, but, but you recognize it only when you have that steward perspective in mind. That's it. Any further questions? The by base excess doesn't mean anything about compensation. It tells you what is actually happening in the body. It is not part of the compensated response. If it's a chronic respiratory process, yes, it is part of the compensated response. But the compensated the response... Then the respiratory part also will play a part to the No, what I'm saying is this is primarily a respiratory disease. Chronic, chronic respiratory failure would cause a positive base excess. Hmm. Whereas here it is negative. So in a, that way also, if you look at it, it tells you that this is not appropriate for the CO2 of 56.4 if it's chronic. So a metabolic compensation for a respiratory failure is to make the base excess positive, hmm. not to make it negative. Uh, one more question. Can you use uh, one by four normal saline? Uh, I've not used it. If it's available, there is, the only problem with uh, when you get more dilute normal saline is hemolysis. Because if you look at the osmotic fragility of red cells, Hypot hypotonic solutions. So yeah. I have no problem if it, if it is safe. But uh, I've uh, usually 25% point one fourth normal saline is not easily available. I have no objection if it is, it is used. But if you use large volumes, be very careful about hemolysis. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what can we do if we, by going by the thank you towards equation, there's a metabolic acidosis, you can increase in the unmeasured anions. The unmeasured anions you're talking about is lactate, keto acids, mm -hmm. and renal failure. Correct? Yes. If that is so, renal failure, you have to dialyze. Lactate. Keto acids, you have to use insulin. Perfect. Lactic acidosis, you improve, improve perfusion. You basically have to, and if it is salicylate or some poison, then you have to remove it. So that's the way to go. And if it is uh, dialysis, usually removes most anions. If you are unsure what's happening, dialyze the patient. If you know what is happening, treat the specific cause. Sounds very simple. <laughs> that's as simple as you can make it, but dialysis is not simple. A lot of uh, work involved in dialyzing a patient sometimes. Next uh, question of the GI. For a patient who came with diarrhea, if you're showing severe metabolic acidosis and hyperchloremia and hypernatremia, what would be the ideal flow to you? Yeah, if they're both are high, both sodium and chloride are high, you can use plus plain dextrose. You dilute both. If you do not need resuscitation for blood pressure. If, yeah, if you've got shock, then you have to continue to use normal saline, but you have to be able to use plain water also along with it. So alternate it. Or use half normal saline. Volume resuscitation is takes precedence over this because you need to restrate the volume fast to get rid of the acidosis. So you have to have your priorities right. Blood pressure is low, you have to get the BP up. So use a volume resuscitation. And if you've got albumin, use albumin. Use colloids to bring up the blood pressure. But keep an eye on the sodium and the chloride. Make sure it is, you're not increasing it during your resuscitation. So replace vascular volume. And then uh, make sure the fluid you give does not worsen the already existing hyperchloremia and hypernatremia. How often do we have to then monitor ABG in that situation when we know that we are... I would say it depends on... Yeah, thing. how fast you're giving the fluids. So, I mean, if you're giving fluids very fast, you can even do it every four hours. But if it is uh, not fast, you do it every six hours or even twice a day. Because most ABGs, machines now give you the whole printout, mm -hmm. sodium and the whole electrolyte value. So, and the lactate. So it, the trend is important for you to look at. If your lactate is improving, your shock state is improving. And uh, it depends on how fast you're... Yes, ringer lactate is good. Questions, I would, for others, I would ringer lactate be good for volume replacement as there's more sodium than chloride? It depends on the actual basic values of the sodium, if the sodium is already 150 and the chloride is 130, it's not very good. But if the sodium is 120 and the chloride is 110, yes, ringolactate would be good. So I would say it's like a bit of a ligo. You put in the piece depending on the 
lacuna which is exists in hypertension patient regalactate is like saline it is good for resuscitation volume wise it is good because studies have this is more in shock crystalloids are as good as colloids for resuscitation so we very worried about uh, the sodium and the sodium is really high you can use salt free albumin for resuscitation but that is very expensive so if you have sodium high chloride low you have to use so you can use bicarbonate dextrose if you have a person who has got a uh, uh, person with sodium low and chloride low you can use normal saline if you have got a patient who has got uh, any combination dip, just depends on the combination you have you choose the iv fluid depending on the lacuna there is and monitor the thing with icu is you have to monitor the response to what you are doing so that you catch any problems earlier rather than later we can continue this discussion as you go through this abgs and uh, you can use any number of approaches you want but the answers may not fit in perfectly because this is real life this is not manufactured uh, values so if there are minor differences in your answers it really doesn't matter because it would not make a big clinical difference in your treatment and that is expected as in real life there will be small changes in uh, numbers when you put this uh, uh ways of solving the puzzle in real life so don't worry about that try to get the big picture and we will discuss the discrepancies in the smaller numbers as to whether it's clinically relevant or not so keep this as an ongoing discussion we can have a couple of abgs after every session but do it yourself first get your answers compare it with the other answers and then we can proceed to discuss the most important thing is you must know what is happening to the patient not just put a label on the problem Any further questions? We can wait for two more minutes. I'm fine with questions. I'm just sitting in air conditioned comfort here. <laughs> They will want to go home. No, no, no. <laughs> As you mentioned, like in your his books also, like how you mentioned, when you're approaching all your mixed disorders, one thing that we won't see is uh, because only organ affected respiratory part of the lung, so there's no combination of acidosis and alkalosis. Acute acidosis, correct. So it's working out. Question. Did not. Did not oh. Question okay, that's good. We didn't give the answers then. <laughs> Let's send them all the ABG quiz. quiz. We'll send that. Don't worry, no problems. Sorry about that. We'll send you that. And if if at all if you can please dis I mean disclose yourself because it's name easier for us to. Condition. There's massive blood loss. Can use. You can use basic stress in any situation. I mean, you can use any of that in any situation. Why would you ask that question? I'm sorry, I don't understand uh, why you could not use base excess in trauma and GI bleed. Is there any reason why you should not use it in trauma and GI bleed? You can use it in any metabolic uh, disorder. The base excess, provided you know its limitations. But if it's massive bleed, the hemoglobin is very low. Obviously, it has a rapidly. Yes, you are right. So hemoglobin will keep changing. So the buffering capacity of hemoglobin will keep changing, and therefore the the base excess will change according to the hemoglobin at yes. that point in time. So again, it comes down to the the standard base excess. Yes, you can use corrected. standard base excess corrected. But what she is asking is, when you do a blood gas, the HP may have been three. Then you transfuse the patient because of blood going. There may be ten the next time. So each time you have to keep repeating the ABG if you want to know what's happening. You can't use a previous value for the correction. What what is basics is being easier. Okay, okay. One second. We we'll take one at a time. Several questions here. Yeah, you are right. HP is a component of basics calculation, so it keeps changing according to the HP. So basics will change according to the HP. That is a given. So so long as you know what is happening. Use it with the knowledge that the HP is changed, so the base excess has changed. Don't uh, use it blindly. That's all. What is base excess B? Yeah. Ah, Later. actually, <clears throat> some blood gas machines use the term base excess B for actual base excess, and base excess ECF for standard base excess. The diluted. Yeah, the diluted one is. Uh, that's why. That's why I said it's important to understand the concepts. Then these labels uh, become clearer. Base excess B is base excess in blood or actual base excess. Base excess ECF is with the diluted hemoglobin, 
the constant and the hemoglobin is diluted in the whole of these ah, so it makes sense now those are the words yeah. in acute blood loss does the buff of course it changes yes the buffering action of blood change so it places in the so the question is uh, when a, there is a dynamic situation nothing is reliable you have to take a variety of parameters remember that the blood gas is only the situation at a point in time stand alone yeah it's a one point it's a cross section it's a one the point uh, at which you take it that is the situation so next moment you give him one liter of blood that will change and so you have to do a repeat blood gas if you want to know what's happening it's as simple as that so whether something is reliable or not depends on the brain which is using it don't put too much weight on any number look at the patient and look at a set of numbers if the bp is improving the heart rate is coming down as you are giving blood the saturation is improving the patient is improving things should be fine the numbers are only a help for you to decide what is happening or what could happen in the future everything is reliable with its limits that's it even my lectures please try to work out on the questions i think it will have a good time working out the questions have fun it's like a puzzle there's no exam there's no marks it's only for your own mind and when you work it out you will find that your understanding gets much better and don't sit and do all 20 at the same time then it loses its fun part of it and write down the queries you have as it comes up if you find it is different from the answers given write it down and then you, we can think it through you can even mail it to the email id medicine to at med to at cmcvalu.ac.in we can collect all these questions and then yeah. sir and then it can be answered but uh, when you refer to something please refer to the question because i don't want to answer the wrong query to the wrong question the lecture and the context yeah i think then uh okay no further questions have a good I... time answering questions thank you lot sir i think welcome we'll meet up on next friday on at 3 pm yeah uh for that it will be respiratory physiology and respiratory failure part 1 and then part 2 will be followed by that on saturday uh, saturday 12 to 1 yeah but send your suggestions as you want whether want the abg discussion before or after the lecture okay if they want we can start off with every lecture 15 minutes for discussion of abg then follow yes, it to the lecture that's also fine sure. uh please feel uh, the feedback forms will be forwarded to all all the faculty please feel free to uh, update our forms it's one time uh, please log in with your gmail id and it's a google doc drive questionnaire form for feedback it will be very much useful to improvise on the next lectures yeah thank you for coordinating it thank you thank you sir thank Thanks you a lot we'll find the photo